All right, Sev. We made it. Episode 10 and haven't been canceled yet. So we made it to number 10. Number 10. We're going to talk about today. You know, we hear it all the time. What's it like to work out NBA players? Like all these people put it on Instagram, these special NBA workouts that only NBA players do. Like it's this community. Like it's literally following the yellow brick road trying to get to Oz with, to find this special workout that um, only, you know, only NBA people do. And right. I, just, I just think it's BS, man. Like there's nothing special about workouts in the NBA. If anything else, they're more fundamental than any other workout. I remember uh, one of my first NBA workouts I watched, you know, I went to the Celtics and I watched like Rick Pitino put guys to workouts. I would watch, and then I would be like, wait a minute. And now I know he coached in college, but he was in the NBA for, for a while with the Knicks. And he's just, it's fundamental. It was just working on simple stuff. Then I would watch other people. Yeah. And I, I mean, some of them work out with these dynamic things or whatever the hell dynamic means. But like, I want to talk to you about it because you've worked out, you know, as many NBA players as I have, probably more. Like, what do you, you know, let's just talk about what goes into a regular workout with right. an NBA team when you're with a team, when you're putting players to workouts and, and what goes in that. I mean, we've talked about some of these things before anyway, but let's reiterate that there's yeah. no aura of an NBA workout. It's the same thing. It's the same. Now, Sweet Chuck, nice Wizard of Oz reference at the beginning. Appreciate because, it. Because, you know, it's a lot like, you know, when Dorothy goes and, and, and pulls back that curtain. Yeah. You know, she's, ex she's expecting to find the great and powerful Oz. Yeah. And she pulls back that curtain and, and it's just that little guy, you know, with all these levers and stuff. And she's like, this is the wizard. You know, that's the guy. Come it's on. funny. It's funny. My wife gave me the same talk of the same look when, you know, my, my online dating profile. And then when she met me in person in Chicago, <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> you don't knock it before so, you try it. Yeah, it's true. So it's kind of like, you know, you pull back the curtain and it's like, not that you're, you, you wouldn't be disappointed, but I think you might be surprised at the simplicity um, of, of the work, you know, with those guys and how the repetition is just kind of boring mm -hmm. at times, but that's what gets results. Uh, you know, it's, it's not a lot of, you know, tricky stuff and props and, 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 and all that stuff that sometimes you'll see on the internet. Okay, so you, you get to the Chicago Bulls, you know, back <laughs> when, your first job in the NBA. You worked out guys with Tim Grover and some other people, pros and stuff, but you go to the NBA, you're, you're in there. You get, who, who's the guy, some guys you worked out your first year, like Luel Deng, did you work out well, Luel Deng? Now that first summer, before, before training camp, it was a guy like Kirk Heinrich. Okay. Okay, yeah. Kirk camp. Heinrich, high yeah. level, high level role player, a really good point guard, you know, who's been in the NBA a little bit before he yeah. got to you. Yeah. What do you, what are you stepping on the court and doing with Kirk Heinrich? I tell you, I tell you, I, I'll never. This is one, one of the memories that stays with me with Kirk and, and working with him. That he was great because he brought his own rebounder. So, you know, some guy, a friend of his who lived down the street, a young guy. So right. that was great. But I, I, I remember this distinctly. Uh, we're on the court and we're working on, I'm working on this one, you know, move, this, this shot fake and then this spin. And, and he looks at me and he goes, that's not going to work in my game in the NBA. Why are we working on that? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know what? You're probably right. Yeah. So in my mind, I thought, here's this, here's this NBA established player. We, you know, we should probably try this tricky move you know, that I saw Kobe do or mm -hmm. something, which was totally uh, irrelevant for his game. And he called me on it. Right. And he was right. You know, so from then on, it was like, okay, we go back and watch the film of, of him and how he played and what the coaches wanted out of him. Um, so that was a little bit of an eye-opening thing because I thought, wow, these guys, you know, they probably want tricky stuff. Yeah. They don't. You're right. Now, some, of, some of them do, you know, but – most of them want simple stuff. And so I remember that, that first summer with Kirk, it was all, you know, 
pick and roll pull-ups, pick and roll floaters, you know, a deep pick and roll, they go under threes, spot shooting, you know, very basic, simple stuff that you would think, you know, oh, that's, that's, that's simple. Mm -hmm. And it is. Yeah, but, very uh, routine based. Yeah, very routine based. And then, you know, some guys like I remember Ben Gordon, you know, that summer, uh, he liked a little more of the tricky stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, because he was a better ball handler and he liked a little more of that, you know, uh, shifty stuff and shake and bake stuff. So. And with his size, he probably needed it to get separation a little bit more than Kurt did. Right. Yeah, yeah. because as you call it, the seahorse, he's only about 6'1". Yeah. Yeah. So he, he, <laughs> he kind of needed that. Yeah. So that was kind of my introduction to working with – now, we'd worked with NBA players with Tim, you know, in the previous years. But this was my first time actually being with a team. Mm -hmm. uh, and working with guys every day, you know, from a team standpoint. Yeah. And, and I think people just got to understand that, like, just like anything else, you can't group somebody in a group. You yeah. can't just say all NBA players have do all these moves and these elite things because they don't. Now, some do. Now, some really like need that for, you know, to try, try to get themselves going, especially in workouts. But most of them. I would say 90%, maybe more, are just sort of basic spots, a little movement, uh, some situation they want to work in, some ball handling, depending on the position, three-point shooting. Uh, maybe they can go one-on-one -on -one with somebody at, at the end of the workout. But for the most part, they don't really work on crazy things. They, right. You know, I see – you see things online about people picking up cones when they dribble and then like jumping up and, you know, getting out of the way of something thrown at them. Look, if that's what you do, that's what you do, but don't sell it as only NBA players do this, or this is what NBA players do because in the majority they don't like, I, I feel as though like you always say repetition is a punishment. Like all they do is rep out things that they do in games and rep out and rep out. And don't ever try to – and with most, don't try to ever to go out of the routine. I remember um, right. working out Chris Heron. And oh, yeah. hey, my all-time favorite Fresno State player, oh, Chris Heron. Yeah, Chris Heron. I mean, People have no idea what a great player he was. Yeah. You know, it's you funny. And I it's funny. He was in my state, and I knew about him because right. of his, his brother. Like his brother Mike right. yeah. uh, was a state champion – warriors six four you know so i heard of this chris heron guy but there was no internet back then he was in fall river which is like an right. hour south of me and i always heard of this chris heron guy chris heron chris heron chris heron but you know you think it's like chris heron is gonna go on and you know maybe like i don't know like go to like some division two school low one just because most not a lot of guys from mass were high major division one players and i never even seen him play so then I hear stories about him playing for the AU team that I was about to coach for a, a year or two in the, in the future called the BABC and how he played well in Vegas and how like Kentucky, BC, Syracuse, Wisconsin, Florida, and all these guys are offering him scholarships. So like, I'm like, oh, what the, you know, Chris Heron who? So I drove to Rhode Island to watch him in an AAU tournament. He, he was one of the nastiest Oh. guards I've ever seen play against McDonald's all Americans just tough yeah so um so Frank Catapano that I met, mentioned in our mentor episode um Frank Catapano represented him and he asked me to go down to Fall River to work him out for the you know for the draft and I did you know get him ready for the draft and then I remember working him out that um a year from then I just came back from this Nike coaches clinic in Atlanta and they had all these drills with like cones and stuff. And I never, oh, I never really was into that. So like we're, we're in the armory at Fall River. No, boys club, boys club. And I get this barrel out and I get this barrel in this chair and uh, trying to set this thing up. He goes, switch up. Stop what the fuck you're doing. If you even try to do this drill, I'm going to put, I'm going to, I'm going to throw you in that barrel, put that cone on your head and roll you back to fucking Rivera. If you try to do this drill with me, he goes, fuck that stuff. Like that stuff is no good. Like that stuff is no good. No tricky stuff. All I do is I'm a backup guard for the Denver Nuggets. 
all I need to be able to do is come off pick and roll and shoot, makes like get the ball in and then re-space for shots, make threes, drive it, floater. And Chris was one of my best, you know, I talk about Kobe a lot, but Chris was my best mentor as far as like NBA players teaching me what NBA players really do because he was going to be a backup, a journeyman, maybe a starter, maybe a Steve Blake type if, if his career went the way he wanted to go. So he had a stick. So he had to do things that are simple. And he taught me about what was bullshit and what was real as far as working out players. And it was awesome. But that story about him telling me he was going to put a cone in my head, put me in the barrel and roll me back to, fall, uh, to Revere an hour away was fantastic. Yeah, it's, you know, it, people, you know, when they peek behind the curtain, mm. they're going to be amazed. They would be amazed at how, how, the simplicity of the work. Mm-hmm. Uh, like you said, the, the repetition is not punishment. And, and players at that level, they have to fight the boredom. And the ones that can fight the boredom and, and, and just persevere and, and see the big picture at the end are the ones that will actually improve. You know, and, and NBA players that, that want to change their workout every other day or every week, you know, to, to this and then that, and then we're going to work on this, and then we're going to do that. And you know, those are the guys that don't show improvement. Yeah. And, and, and the ones that will pick out, and you tell me if I'm wrong, but at the end of the season, the ones that will say these two things or these three things. Yeah. And that's it. You know, all – I'll, uh, you know, you know, I'll keep up with the other stuff, you know, and maintain it. But these two things are what I really need to improve on this off season. And as you can imagine, if it's just two skills or two things that can be tedious and that can be boring, but the ones that are able to fight through that boredom are the ones that improve. Yeah. And, and you got to keep doing those things. Like, like, you have your routine of your skill sets that you do in games. So NBA players like Dirk Nowitzki, like Dirk never changed. I never really worked with Dirk. All I was is comedy. Like when I would work yeah. him up before games our last year, all it was is jokes. Like, let me tell you, it's, it's one of the greatest things I've ever seen. Oh, it, it could have definitely been a reality show. NBA had no idea about ratings because if, if they ever mic'd us up, it would have been fantastic. But like they tell me the people that were there way before I was there, and telling me, look, he never really changes his routine. 18 years, 20 years, he just did the same thing. And it's like, you know, and you were talking about players who just change workouts all the time. Um, It's sort of like, I remember when I was a kid, now you never really had to deal with this because uh, for most of your life you were in nice California, but in Boston, it was cold as hell in in January and February. And there was like snow on the ground. Well, it's, it's it's miserable. I love it, but it was miserable. So my dad would tell me to warm the car up before he would drive into school. So right. one time I, I warmed the car up, got, got the gauge. You, you never have to worry about this, but how to get the gauge all the way. It took like 20 minutes to warm up to like acceptable level for your engine. And then once I, I, I got there, the first time I just shut it off and went back in the house. And he goes, you fucking asshole. The thing is going to go back to cold. What are you doing? It's the same thing as your skill. Like you can't just like work on something until you're good at it. And then don't work right. on it again and work on something else because you're going to need that to stay warm and stay a part of you to be able to do in games. So like, that's why a lot of these NBA players, they work on the same thing over and over and over and over again. Now they may not spend an hour on one thing, but they're going to spend a lot of time and a lot of reps on the things to keep it relevant in their game. That's, and, it's funny. Um, you know, the Dirk thing reminds me of the summer that we signed J.J. Redick as a free agent. Ha! Uh, I um, love J.J. Yeah, he's, he's the best. Mm-hmm. And he lived in Austin, Texas at the time. Right. So Doc, Doc had me and Kevin Eastman. Uh, I don't know why he wanted two coaches to go down there, but he wanted two coaches to go down there and, you know, spend a couple of days with J.J., work him out, take him to dinner, that kind of stuff, get to know him. Mm-hmm. So – we meet JJ, Kevin, and I at the University of Texas practice facility, which is okay. a beautiful facility. I heard. Yeah, it's great. But, uh, you know, we go on the floor and, and we're like, okay, and let's, you know, let's do this drill and let's do that drill. And he goes, fellas, I, 
I got my routine. You know, exactly. I, I know what I need to do. I got my routine. Yep. You guys just, you know, pass me the ball, rebound, you know, clap your hands, whatever. But I got my routine. And then at the end, if you want to do a couple of your things, that's fine. Mm-hmm. But he and, you know, I, we had JJ for maybe three years. I don't know, whatever it was, three or four years. His routine never changed. He, you know, pre-practice, after practice, pre-game, he, you know, his routine was his routine. Mm-hmm. And this is what I do in the game. This is what I'm going to do in my workout. Um, he was his own coach, basically, is what I'm saying. Right. So that, that was a little bit of an eye-opener to me, too. Yeah, it's crazy how, how these guys do these routines and, and stay with them. And, and, and I really value those types of players because, like we talk about, you know, like 80% of the league are role players. And, and right. They, one or two things and you know and they need that routine they need like a routine and all the stuff that they do but they just keep it for the most part simple and you know you know some players are going to be different some players are going to be like all right what do you want to do and then some players right. are going to be like this is what i do stay out of my way and then and, and i think it's good for a workout coach or a player development coach to watch anyway the first couple of times you work out a player you probably just want to watch and sit back and then maybe add something. And that's where I think you get in anyway. Like, like, the, like the one thing you might be able to add to that whole workout and not say much. Because I think they're trying to size you up. You're trying to size them up anyway. But, man, like the simplicity of a lot of these NBA player workouts is just crazy. Like, there's not a lot of nutty things that go along in it. And, uh, and, and, and you know, if you, if you watch the games, there's, you know, 5% of the, of the, of the plays and the shots – are very, very, you know, creative, you know, by tremendously talented players. Mm-hmm. And if you ask them, you know, well, what did you do? And half the time they couldn't even tell you. They, I don't know. I just do it. Right. And yeah. then 95, 90 to 95% of the play and the shots are very simple, basic shots. You know, floaters, pull-ups, turnarounds, catch and shoot threes, transition, you know, all, all that. You know, the tricky stuff, the fancy stuff, the improvisation, improvisational stuff is well, for the special guys. Yeah. Now I remember we, we had Jamal and, and, and he Jamal was, Crawford Crawford, and he, and he would just do these amazing things. And I, the next morning I said, Jamal, you know, how do you do it? What do you, he goes, I don't know, coach. I just do it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not, it's, I don't work on it. Yeah. It's something I do. So those guys, that that's the five percenters. Mm-hmm. The 95 percenters of the, the guys that we talk about, the basic, simple guys, role yeah. player guys. Yeah, I agree. I, yeah, I tell the story about Kobe all the time. And um, it was 2011. We, 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 uh, Tim and I went down to um, Irvine to work him out. Hey, did you stay at Pelican Hill? I did. Hell yeah, we did. Hell yeah, we did. Might be the nicest resort in California. In the world. You give me one place <laughs> in the world that I could live, I'm living there. Um, and he, uh, we were working out, and, and he had me on the plane ride in, break down all his film for the year before, and, you know, we are going to talk and things. And he, and he, uh, this was, like, right before the lockout ended. And there was this move he did, like, combo move, which was, you know, like, in and out, crossover, step back. And I saw him do it, like, four to six times in, like, a three-week period throughout the season. So, uh, you know, at the end of the workout, which was simple as hell, by the way, uh, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but like, I said, all right, Kobe, we're going to do in and out crossover step back. Goes, Mike, I never work on that. I, you know, we're not going to do it. I, I said, well, wait a minute. I did see you do it like four or five, six times in a couple week period. He goes, yeah. So what I, what I do is I, I work on each individual move until I'm a master at it. So like the in and out layup, the in and out pull up the crossover layup, crossover pull up, step back, jump shot, step back, pull in front and finish. So I practice each one of those things uh, uh, infinite times to become a master at each one of those shots. So when I want to do something and they take it away, I have the combo. I have the, I I could just make the decision. I don't want to be a robot and work on all this, you know, combo move things because it's not you. You never want to predetermine what move you're going to make. You have to read off your defense, and that made a lot of sense to me. And and probably the 40, 50 times I worked out Kobe, I don't think, um, you know, I don't think I've ever seen an elite drill, 
uh, a crazy drill, anything on the court, cones, tennis balls, anything like that. And, and look, if that, like I used to make fun of that stuff all the time and I still do to a certain degree, but if that's the way you do it, that's the way you do it. But I have to speak up on the NBA fraternity. I've, I've been around the NBA for 20 plus years. I've never seen that consistently done where all these crazy moves and crazy things are worked on on the court with all these props and things. I've never seen it. And you talk to most player development people at the NBA level and they've for the most part, never seen it, you know? So look, if that's, if that's the shtick that right. you're putting out, that's great. But you know, if, if that's, if that's what you think that's in the NBA where it's all this crazy stuff, it's not, it really isn't, you know, and you know, Kobe's one of the top five players or six players of all time, you know, arguably Dirk's one of the top 20 players of all time. You know, you've seen it in, in Chris Paul, you've seen it, in, in you know you've seen it in Blake Griffin, Chris Paul, Well Dang, all the great players you've been around. You know I, I just haven't seen it. I haven't I haven't seen it in most players. You know I'll tell you what most of the bad players that you watch do it. Not all bad players do it, but that's that's those are the play. The inconsistent players are the ones looking for that next drill or whatever. You know. Yeah, they're the ones that are they're always you know they seem always seem to be searching. You know for the next big thing the next answer they're always searching for something new and what's the next thing and yeah you know, instead of just you know being consistent and with the simplicity and stuff like that i have a player in mind that we we had uh, early in his career when i was with the bulls and he went from trainer to trainer yeah um, you, know, you know different drills to different drills you know he could never find something and stay with it he was always searching for the next trainer uh, the next drill, the next secret sauce. Yeah. You know, and, and as a result, he never found it, you know, and then uh, he was out of the league in a, in, in a few years. So, yeah, I think building your foundation is really important as any type of player at any level. And I think if you're just doing like, you just keep on changing these things. Look, if there's like the one thing I don't understand on some trainers that they'll say, all right, this is the next move. Right. And then the week later, they never mention that move ever again. And then they're on to the next move. Like, first of all, you said this is game changing. And then you never hear about it again. First of all, there aren't that many moves. Let's be honest. Second, yeah. like, you need a foundation. If this is what your thing's going to be, that's what this, your thing's going to be. And you work the hell out of it until you're a master at it. But the, it, it's like, you know, the attention span, it's like, I got to go to the next thing. I got to go to the next thing. But you know, this stuff about elite and next level and dynamic, like it's all, it's all just like catchphrases to get to catch your eye. And yeah. I just don't think the NBA is like that. Like high level players are like that. For the most part, you know, you watch NBA players throughout the season, I would say 90% of their workout stays the same. And if you watch how sh players get their shots in a game, like go to YouTube and go to like house of highlights and just watching the types of shots that players get in games out of the 20 shots or 18 shots, a guy gets maybe three are, and, and I'm talking about a high level player, like a Durant, uh, like a Kobe, like a Doncic, like a Harden, you know, maybe some of the high, like some of those players are higher end more like that, but like three out of 18 shots might be tough. You know, a lot of them are straight line drives, pull-ups, cuts, you know, transition, you know, just catch and shoot. Um, they're not all this crazy stuff. And if it's, it's just like – and people think, well, that's what they do at the NBA. And you have a lot of these guys who say they do NBA drills. I, I still don't know what a fucking NBA drill is. I don't know what that means when they say that. Yeah. I have no idea what that means. Yeah. It's a basketball drill. Basketball is yeah. basketball, you know. Yeah. And – you know, I do a lot of work with young kids, you know, middle school kids and sure. elementary. And I said, look, guys, you know, we're going to do with you, you know, pretty much the same thing that guys in the NBA do. You know, they're faster, they're bigger, they're stronger. Yeah. But the stuff we're going to work on is, for the most part, is, is what they work on. Yeah. So, you know, um, the one thing I, I think you know, we do need to be aware of, and, and you and I have kind of seen – the transformation uh, is you got to be willing to change and adapt as the game changes. Yeah. Um, 15 years ago, we never saw 
uh, the bigs shooting so many threes. Right. Um, you know, the, the range that the guards can shoot with now mm -hmm. uh, is amazing. And, and, and so you got to be able to adapt with the times also and with the way the game changes, you got to be able to adapt too. So you can't be to the point where you're so stubborn that you don't change with, uh, you know, with the game. I mean, you know, 15 years ago when I saw Brooke and Robin Lopez playing in high school, Mm -hmm. um, you know, they were both, you know, they were just, you know, back to the basket. They could play from five feet in. Right. You know, Brooke could shoot a little bit than Robin. Right. And now fast forward 15 years later, and they're both stretch fives. You know, I mean, you know, Robin's one of the best shooting bigs in the league, and Brooke is, you know, one of the best shooting – excuse me, Brooke is one of the best, and Robin now has developed – you know, as a seven footer, you know, 34 for a hundred from the three point line this year, 15 years ago, if you told me that watching them as high school players, I would have said, you're crazy. Yeah. Uh, but you got to be able to uh, adapt as the game changes. Yeah. I just, I remember watching, you know, in my career with Dallas was sort of the time Brooke was sort of developing into the stretch big and watching. Uh, I remember when he came in, he was a post up player. Oh, a total post up player. You know, with and the match early in his career. Yeah, just watching him like, you know, working on corner threes at first, and I'm in pregame, and I'm like, what is he doing? Like, he's yeah. not that type of player. He's 15 feet and in, tops, and um, and then like every time we would play Brooklyn, played him twice a year, obviously, he'd work on more and more things from three, when and then shooting on the move, and then pick and pop, and then just transition pull ups on the trail, and then now being able to do all this stuff. Um, his progression, yeah, you definitely get a change with the times. But, again, coming back to it, though, man, like, I just think that, like, when people talk about NBA work, the only, like you said, the only things with NBA players over high school or college players, your expectations of them physically, talent-wise, and some of the things that they can do are different. But the, 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 the fundamental skill that you work with with a player is the same, totally the same. Except some, maybe some of the things, if you work with an 11-year-old, they probably don't have the range or can't do step backs and things. But, like, everything else, the footwork, the shot itself, um, you know, creating space, reading defense, defensive stance, closing out, all that stuff is the same. How would it change? And, and, and I, I just think that people have a, a misconception, especially the ones that aren't really, like, privy to watch an NBA players work out except on YouTube and things, but like, you know, it's just the same. And, um, you know, some trainers do it like that. Like they're not all that fancy all the time. Some are, and, and they make their living on selling that dream of only doing NBA drills instead of like what they would do. It's just, it's crazy and stupid, but that's what they do. And you know, I feel bad for the parents and players that get duped into it because there's really no difference. And yeah, that, and we touched on that when we did our trainer episode, you know, you know, for uh, advice for parents too. So, sure. yeah. so as, we, as we peel back the curtain, uh, it's, don't be surprised uh, by what you see because it's, it's not what you had imagined as Dorothy found out. Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not. It's crazy. It is. I and mean, when you peel that curtain back, you're just going to find it's, it's just this little guy pulling switches. It's not, it's not this thing that you really think it is. It's, you know, and some people know, I mean, some people see it and they're like, no, you're right. It's not, you know, and maybe I thought I was nuts, but then I would talk to other play, player development people around the league you know, in pregame and stuff, I'm like, what do you guys work on? Like drill wise, do you, do you do all this crazy stuff? And, and, and certain players like to do those sorts of things. But like I said, it's less than seven or 8% of the league would even think about doing a few of those things rather than all these like different types of drills, you know, I, maybe like I'm thinking back, like maybe if you wanted to get a guy motivated a little bit and, and it's midway through the year, they're a little tired of doing the same thing over. And then you do all this. I remember Dave Hopla, when he was working out Kobe for the draft and he would work players out for the draft, he would do all these shuttle runs. He would call them like, like he would time them for a minute and he would have to do all these types of shots in a minute, see how many points they can get. And, you know, and they were pretty cool drills. There were different types of shots, but they were simple shots. They were just timed. 
yeah, I guess you would do some things like that, but never like on a long period of time, more than one day, like out of like, you know, a season or a couple of times a year, but you know, doing all these crazy drills, is, it's, you know, like you said, it just sets the player back because, you know, you can't just go from drill to drill to drill to different move to different move to different move to different move, you know? Yeah, that's, you know, that's for the special 5% of guys. Yeah. And even uh, like Kevin Durant. And, and, and even even then, like I mentioned with Jamal, they, they probably couldn't tell you what they did. It's like, yeah. I don't know. I just do it. And they just do it. It's <laughs> yeah. just natural. Those it's, are the special ones. Yeah, it's just, just natural. Yeah. You know, Jamal was such a – you know, we'll talk a couple of minutes on Jamal. I mean, Jamal is just such a special breed of player. Like, he just, like, reads the situation, like, naturally. And, like, just his knack to get shots off and finish and, you know, just over big players and smaller players – in traffic, in, in different situations, using his – contorting his body, like, it's crazy the stuff that he could do. Yeah, he uh, – you know, when we had him, you know, probably five years ago, four years ago. He was – he he was probably – that was him at his best. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he's had 50-point games with, what, three different teams? Yeah, one – I think the last – last – Last yeah. game of the year, last maybe, year. maybe four teams. I don't know. I think he but. had it against Dallas. Actually, my last game as a Dallas Maverick. I think he had like fifty-one up with Phoenix. Yeah, but he, he's one of those guys that, um, yeah, he he doesn't he doesn't really work on all that stuff. He can just do it. Yeah, you know. Now he, he's yeah. a special one. Oh yeah, and he's just a. It's funny, like, and we'll talk about this in other episodes, but like. He's just – he like you told me all the time, he's a guy that, like, 50 years old, he's going to be playing in YMCA. Oh, league. there's no question. He just loves the game. And he loves, I don't know if I've ever been around a guy that loves basketball as much as he does. Yeah, and, and I think players do, for the most part, throughout their 20s and early 30s. And then I think once they start getting, like, mid-30s, they start getting a little tired of it and, like, all right, when this is over, I'm not really playing anymore. I you won't know? pick up a ball again the rest of my life. Ever. And this is a guy who just can't stop. He, he yeah. can't – literally can't stop himself from playing. And those are the guys that, you know, I've never worked with Jamal, but, like, you know, he, those are the type of guys that are like, yeah, like that's the kind of guy I want to I be around because those are the guys that, that, that gets you excited about, you know, going to work every day. Uh, he, he's the ultimate gym. I, just real quick and last thing on him, but we, we get home from a road trip. You know how those things go. You get in – in the West Coast, like two in the morning, mm -hmm. three in the morning, and nine o'clock the next morning, ten o'clock. If I if I got a couple of young guys, guess who's in there? <laughs> yeah, Rondo was like that too. He just he can't help himself, man. He's in that gym. He just not just to work out, but just to watch. Yeah, yeah. Those are the guys that spe yeah love it that you don't have to drag out of bed to work out, and you know those are those are special those those are special breeds, a special type of people that you like working with and, and those are the success stories that you love hearing about you know yeah. so that 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 he was a he was a cool cool cat he was good so, so we we've uh we've gone behind the curtain gone behind the curtain my friend uh, i have my emerald slippers on right now i just can't put the camera down there so you know i have my emerald slippers and you know ruby slippers ruby slippers ruby emerald castle emerald was the city i love that emerald city oh yeah Emerald love city. that Emerald City. And so I guess we can uh, click our heels together three times and say, there's no place like home. Yeah, maybe the, uh, maybe the wizard can get me a waistline. Uh, maybe I could go to follow the yellow brick road. He can give me a waistline. All right. All right, brother. Eh. Eh.